Alrighty, let's, um, <clears throat> does everybody have the, the new handout that was at the door coming in? No? Oh. <laughs> while we're um, while we're waiting here, let's just do a little bit of review uh, from the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, first of all, can somebody define for me uh, the two? Well, actually, first of all, express the two different ways in which the church is described in the scriptures, and um, I mean by the two general distinctions, and uh, define them. If it's too obvious, visible and okay, visible and invisible, and would you define one or the other, whichever you like? Okay, so the visible church are those who profess the true faith, and of course, um, the the Westminster Confession does tack on an additional group, which is and their children. Okay. And then the invisible church is the church as who sees it? As God sees it, yes. And why is it that only God can see the invisible church? Because only God can see the heart. Okay, only God can see the heart. Only God knows those to whom he has entrusted that, that grace. That doesn't mean that we can't see true believers, but uh, we don't see them as God sees them. We don't know with absolute certainty whether somebody's a Christian or not. So, oh, Greg? The invisible church also includes those who have believed in Christ before us and are now in glory. That's true. We cannot see them. Another reason we can't see them, that's right. The scripture calls them the invisible, well, the, the spirits of righteous men made perfect in heaven. Since we're not in heaven and since we can't see spirits anyway, uh, we wouldn't be able to see them. Okay. So they're invisible in that sense. And of course, as we know, there are those yet to be born who... Um, are a part of that church, or at least will be a part of that church. They're a part of the total number, although not literally a part of the church until they exist and until they trust in the Lord. Okay. All right. Now we we move from we went from the invisible church to the visible church, and then we looked at a couple of things regarding what is true about the visible church. And uh, there are two categories of characteristics that we looked at. The first group was called the attributes of the church, and can anyone remember what the attributes of the church are? And where they're found? <laughs> Pam, did you want to try that? How many churches are there? Oh, one. <laughs> yes, one, that's right. One holy, catholic, and apostolic church, which I think we found that in the Nicene Creed, didn't we? Yeah. There's only one church, and actually, um, uh, let's see, would we say there's only one visible church? There's a lot of uh, denominations, but um, those who profess the, the true religion, okay, which is uh, cross-denominational. Okay, it's not uh, just centered in one denomination. Uh, the church is holy, separated unto the Lord, and of course called to be holy in life. And then uh, Catholic in that it's universal and not Roman Catholic, and apostolic in that it's based on the apostolic teachings. Okay. Now, what are the marks of the church? Jan? Okay, that's, that's one of the three that are historically called the marks of the church, yes? So, preaching of the gospel, church discipline, and the right administration of the sacraments, that's right. And are all three of those necessary to have a church? Okay, now we, we, there is one that is necessary, and which one is it? <laughs> discipline. <laughs> Not discipline. Okay, the, the right preaching of the gospel. Because without the gospel, there, there is no gathering of the elect, there is no salvation. Okay, if there's no gospel, there's no salvation. If there's no salvation, there's no church, either visible or invisible, right? So you have to have the, the gospel or you have no church. Uh, the others are not necessary, as we said, for the being of the church, but for the well-being of the church, because if you don't have discipline, eventually your, your doctrine is going to become so corrupted that, uh, that you'll lose the gospel. Has that ever happened? <laughs> yes, it, it's happened 
virtually to, well, almost every mainline denomination, every denomination that's ever been formed has, after a couple of generations, has decayed. And of course, if there's no discipline of life and morals, the same thing can take place. And the right administration of the sacraments, though not necessary, the Lord's Supper and baptism are not necessary to have a church, They're not necessary for salvation, are they? You can be saved apart from them, although Christ does command them. They're not as essential as the gospel, right? Thief on the cross wasn't baptized, was he? But he was still saved. He couldn't have been saved apart from the gospel, though, could he? Okay, so he became a part of the church through the gospel and not through these others. Alrighty, so much for review. Let's move into section three, which um, when, you, when you stop and think about, uh, oh, one last thing that uh, the former um, handout had, and that is, is there salvation outside of the church? And uh, the question, we don't understand that as to mean, you know, apart from being a member of a church, can a person be saved? That's how sometimes it's understood. And uh, Hodge reminded us that that's not how we ha need to understand it, and we shouldn't understand it in that way. But apart from the church, who is entrusted with the gospel, remember that the, one of the marks of the church is the right preaching of the gospel, apart from that ministry, there is ordinarily no salvation. Ordinarily. Is there ever extraordinarily? Extraordinarily, outside of the ordinary. If there is, what is, what is it? Uh, are people getting saved in other countries apart from the gospel? Do we not need to do missionary work? Yes, people are being saved. We don't need to do missionary work? Okay, we do need to do missionary work. So what is the extraordinary circumstances under which a person might be saved apart from the gospel? Some might say there are none, but okay. Okay, now you left out, a, at least I think you left out a very important qualifier. Does that include all infants and all yeah. mentally challenged? Okay, those that are elect. Okay, the Lord uh, can still and, and does still save them, uh, you know, even if they don't hear the gospel or understand the gospel. Okay, so the ministry of the church is absolutely necessary. And we're going to see what it is this morning the Lord has equipped his church with in order to carry out this purpose that he has given to the church which is to bring the gospel to others that they might be saved. So section three deals with that. Under this Catholic visible church, Christ has given the ministry, oracles, and ordinances of God for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world and does by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. Now, if we, uh, if we understand this and if we believe this, it should give to us, of course, tremendous encouragement to do what it is that God has called us as a church to do because he has equipped us for the work that he has called us to and he promises that he's going to make what we do effective by his own presence within the church. So, basically, Christ has equipped his church with all that she needs to do the work that he has called her to do. Now, first of all, what has Christ given to equip his church? What are the tools that he has given us to use? Well, obviously, the first one would be the oracles of God. Um, <clears throat> I put it in just a slightly different arrangement than the, uh, the framers of the confession here. He's given us the scriptures. Okay? Uh, one passage in, uh, uh, out of many, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is a reconcil reconciling man to God, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So he has entrusted to the church the gospel, right, which is... I think not just the message narrowly, repent and believe, what Jesus Christ has done, but uh, really the Word of God, which uh, uh, in another passage, I think it's in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul talks about the fact that uh, God has given uh, the, the Word of God, uh, the, well, again, more particularly the Gospel, to his church as a treasure, 
that she is to teach to others, okay, that she is to use, of course, to reach out to the world to gather in the elect. Now, when you think about the importance of the scripture, I mean, why are the scriptures necessary? You know, think about it broadly, think about it narrowly. Why do we need the scriptures? Why is it important that Christ has entrusted those to us? Bridget? For our whole life, it teaches us how to run our life, what we do, not to do. Okay. They, as um, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, provide us with an infallible rule of faith and practice. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, does every church, every visible church, well, let me put it this way, every uh, local church, at least that calls itself a church, uh, uh, do they use the scriptures as they ought to use them? Okay. Oftentimes a church, uh, or a, a visible church, professing church, uh, I want to call it a local church, uh, is run as people would like to see this nation run, as a democracy, rather than as a theocracy. Okay? If I can use that term, I think I, I can use that. Um, and see that what they do is they collect the wisdom or the votes of the members to see what it is we're going to do or what we should do and what they like to do in the worship service, what kind of worship they like to have, uh, what we should be doing as a church, what kind of programs to run, sometimes even what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. Now, is that really up to us? Is it up to any one of us to make that decision? Now, who makes those decisions? Christ makes those decisions. He's the head of the church, right? And the elders, they are the under-shepherds of Christ. They are those appointed and clothed with authority in the church, but their authority is not to minister their own will and to say, this is what we're going to do. So we get together in the session, we just sort of, we vote what I'd like to see happen, what you'd like to see happen. Let's see if we can all find something we agree on. We need to look at the scriptures and see what it is that Christ wants us to do as a church because he is the ruler of the church. He's the head. Okay? That's something that, uh, again, you'd be surprised how few really understand within the church and rule by their own authority. So the scriptures are necessary not only on an individual level to show us what we should believe, to show us what we should, how we should live or corporately what we should believe, but it, it gives us our marching orders as a church what does Christ want us to do? Okay, so that's the first thing he's given to equip his church. Now, if we break that out, uh, we do find that um, Christ has told us several things he does want us to do. Okay, uh, the, we call them the ordinances. Those are the things that he has ordained in his church as a part of our worship and life. Uh, one, of the, one of the first things he's ordained is preaching, which is the authoritative proclamation of his word to his church. Okay. And not just to his church, but really, when you think of evangelism, to all mankind. But this is what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. I, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now, if, if preaching is to be carried on in the church correctly, and if we understand it correctly, what is preaching? Is it a man speaking to us? Is that what it is? If it correctly reflects God's word, then who is it that's really speaking to us? Yeah, the Lord is speaking to us. Christ is preaching to us, isn't he? And this is the exercise of his prophetic office, you might say, in the church. This is his word, and it's being expounded and applied. Okay, that's the way that Christ rules in his church. This is the way he makes his will known to us. Right? That's why, of course, as uh, believers listening to the word of God, we need to uh, examine what we hear as the Bereans, compare it to the scriptures to make sure that what we're hearing is what Christ is actually saying in his word. That's why we need to pay attention. <laughs> we need to pay attention, first of all, to make sure that, that it is God's word, and secondly, if it is, that we listen to it because Christ has appointed this so that he could express his will to us so that we will listen and do what he says. And if we're not listening to what he has appointed as the means to convey his, his will to us, then what are we doing with regard to him? We're disregarding his authority, aren't we? 
So we do need to listen to what he has to say. He has also ordained in the church prayer. Why is prayer important? Bridget? Okay, that's how we speak to him, isn't it? Okay, the Lord speaks to us and we speak to him. What are some of the things we want to say to him? Or that we should say to him? <laughs> Bridget? Okay. Express our love and our thankfulness to him. And is there anything that we might need from him that we'd like to uh, express? <laughs> okay, petitions. We need to lift up our, our petitions to him. This is the way, of course, that we get the Lord's help. And one particular passage where Jesus gives us, uh, uh, again, a tremendous example of the power of prayer. He says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now how can we lift up a prayer of faith? How can we pray a prayer believing so that we can see the, the, these results that Jesus promises? Is it, if I, if I just have enough faith, you know, I mean, can I move a mountain? Can I say to uh, Mount Everest, uh, be taken up and cast into the sea and it should obey me? How, how can I pray and have faith that that prayer is going to be answered? <laughs> right? In the Spirit. Okay, in the Spirit. And um, what would the Spirit, what kind, how would the Spirit, or what, to, um, let's see. What are the kinds of things that I can pray for that the Spirit will give me the confidence to, to, um, to pray in faith? Those things that are according to the will of God. Uh, those things that are according to the will of God. Brenton, do you have your hand up? You going to say that? Okay, yes. According to the promises of God, right? God has promised to give us certain things and we can certainly pray and ask for those things. If we pray uh, according to His will, He hears us and we know that we have the things that He has given us. And as Greg pointed out in, in his earlier example, there are sometimes we don't know exactly what God's will is in some particular situation. But perhaps the Spirit of God will give to us a confidence of faith to pray somehow almost intuitively knowing God is, is ready to answer that prayer. I was going to say that many <coughs> churches have turned this idea of <coughs> praying in faith around so that it does become a matter of us kind of gritting our teeth and summoning the faith, whereas the faith that's spoken of is a gift. And if the Lord doesn't grant it, you can't summon it up. That's right. We can't make it happen. But many churches teach that we can, and uh, you know some of the most extreme examples of that you'll find in, in sort of the uh, the health and wealth gospel kinds of churches, where they actually do teach you that if you can muster up enough faith, you can have anything, you can do anything, you can have the riches of the world, you know, you can be healed of any disease or sickness, but you have to have enough faith. And some even go as far as to say that your faith is actually creative that it has creative power, that you can actually speak into being those things that, that don't exist like God. And then there are others that go even further and say, We're our, we are little gods and so forth, like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, uh, which is absolute heresy. And the idea that we can speak into existence things that aren't is absolute heresy. Only God can do that. Okay. We can only uh, pray for those things that God has promised to give to us. And again, there are things sometimes where the, the promise is broad. We don't know if he's going to answer a particular uh, you know, request in that area, but sometimes he may give us the faith and the confidence that he will do that and give to us great zeal and earnestness in our prayers and trust that he is going to do that. Okay. All right, so prayer, very important. And a very important um, uh, thing that the Lord has given to us, uh, we, we want to call this at the end, these are means of grace, means by which to get the Lord's help to do the work He has called us to do. Sorry about this, um, I forget, do you call that an orphan or a widow? <laughs> I didn't check uh, the formatting. Typically you don't want to have a heading of one word at the bottom of the page, you want to move it to the next page. And I didn't check my, uh, my uh, formatting here, so uh, those of you who are in any kind of an academic program, make sure you don't leave one line or one heading sticking on a page. Make sure you move it to the next. Um, otherwise, you get marked down for that, don't you? Yes. Okay. So the Lord has also given to us praise, which would be another way in which we speak to God uh, in, in song rather than just in prose or in, in words. 
Okay. Um, Edwards asked the question one time, why does the Lord have us sing instead of recite? And uh, the only explanation he could think of was because it has the means of stirring our affections in a way that reciting doesn't. You know, poetry, there's a lot of poetry in the scripture. Uh, you know, the Psalms are poetic and so are the uh, Proverbs. They're cast in a certain form to make them more memorable so that we will remember them. But uh, singing is a very important part of the worship of God and it does stir the affections. And we are to be stirred up in our love for God and express that love to Him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So it has several different functions. It even has a, a way of expressing our faith. We, we're talking about giving the amen at the end of, of these uh, hymns that we sing, which we ought to. We ought to mean the words that we're singing, and we ought to put that stamp at the end saying, this, we really do mean this, let this, let this come to pass. Uh, as we do that, we're admonishing and encouraging one another to do those things as well as we see one another's faith in action, expressing that love, that petition, that adoration, whatever it may be. So praise is a means of grace. The sacraments, uh, the visible signs and seals of God's invisible grace in Christ, okay, the Lord's Supper and baptism, the only two the Lord has given to His church, uh, basically a means of reassuring us of God's love and mercy towards us. Remember, the, uh, the, at least one of the things that we often uh, hear about when we participate in the Lord's Supper, that if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, His broken body, His shed blood was for you. And the Lord wants you to know that that was for you. Also, through these means of grace that God has given to us, the sacraments, uh, when we trust in the Lord, those things that are represented to us are actually sealed to us and applied to us by the Holy Spirit so that what Christ has done for us is, is given to us to strengthen us. Again, what He has done through His flesh and blood is to bring the Holy Spirit back. Is the Holy Spirit important? <laughs> You know, without the Holy Spirit, there's no spiritual life. And without the fullness of the Spirit, there's no fullness of spiritual life. There's no strength to do what we need to do. So the sacraments are a means by which, at least another means by which, we get the help of the Holy Spirit and are reassured of God's grace and His love toward us, which is very important in equipping us to do the work that the Lord has called us to do. Discipline. Discipline is one of the ordinances that Christ has appointed in His church. Uh, why do we discipline? What's the purpose of discipline? Punish people? Is that, uh, is that the idea? Those within the church often look at it as punishment, don't they, if they have to be disciplined? Bridget? Well, to bring back into the point, okay. Right. And really, you, you think of it in the same way that we would discipline our children, don't we? Because we don't discipline our children, I hope we don't, to punish them for the things that they've done, for the you know, inconvenience or distress or stress or agony they put us through, the, the purpose of discipline is to get them to reform, to change, to uh, get out of that bad way of doing things and to bring them into the right way of doing things, ultimately that they might experience God's blessing. Uh, you know, when you think about it, we can't discipline them into the kingdom, that's not what I'm saying. But if we have children that are incorrigible, that, that aren't obeying, that are constantly doing things that are wrong, what's going to happen to them? As they grow up, uh, it's, it's happened even within the church, hasn't it? Children have grown up to be reprobate. Um, there's, you know, uh, again, a sterling example of that would be the, the Karen Keating, who uh, was a part of this church, raised in this church, and went into drugs, went into all, you know, everything you can think of that's just, that's evil. Um, a very, very sad situation. So discipline is, is a means of reforming, of correcting. And even if, the, even if the children, let's say, or the child is not converted, is it better for the child to walk at least externally in the commandments of God than not at all? I would say Israel as, as a nation, even though the vast majority of them were not converted, when, when there was a righteous king who would enforce God's law and they would walk in the right ways, God still blessed them, didn't he? They had temporal blessings because of obedience and I, I don't believe from the scripture there's any reason to suspect that isn't still the case 
that if we do things the right way that God blesses right behavior with temporal blessings but spiritual blessings only come from the saving grace of God Bridget Yeah, we don't want to. Uh, we don't ever want to give up on those that have fallen. Well, let's say not necessarily fallen, but who've never really walked with the Lord. No, we don't want to. Just because they're unconverted now doesn't mean they're never going to be converted. As the, only if they die unconverted can we come to that conclusion. Okay. Alrighty. So discipline is important with regard to our children, but it's the same thing in the Church of God. God disciplines His own children, doesn't He? And He doesn't do it to punish them but he does it to reclaim them. And he gives us, of course, the pattern in, in the Matthew 18 passage, which we've heard many times. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. This is discipline on a, uh, you know, a private level, on, uh, on a peer level, you might say. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, which means, I believe, treat him as though he is an unbeliever. And, but not, of course, okay, and you ask the question, how do you treat tax gatherers and um, uh, Gentiles as objects of evangelism, not as refuse to be cast aside? You know, you don't just say, you're it, that's it, you're out, you're, you're on your way to hell kind of thing, and I wash my hands of you. I don't think that's what the Lord is saying, but he is saying put him out of the fellowship, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, so that he may be taught not to blaspheme, he may repent and be brought back into the fold as a believer. Tom? Uh, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. You know, this has become, I see, a troublesome action that some people think that uh, God has bestowed a great gift to them to go and to all and everyone to correct what they what they deem uh, that they're doing something wrong in their yeah. lives and so forth and uh, it just becomes a nuisance because uh, I'm not saying any, anyone in this church but I'm saying <laughs> that I, I know they, they're just about ready to go and uh, you know cause great commotion and say you know what brother and uh, they, they just think that uh, there's a great gift that God has given them. Is somebody picking on you, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about. We, we've seen people like that. You can go overboard in, in this particular area. Uh, the, the problem is when if somebody, especially, uh, this is a tendency or a temptation that might exist, especially if you read the Puritans and you begin to understand, you know, just what, at least better, I have better understanding of what perfection is and at least what might be attainable and what, what is it Christ wants us to be. And then you, you, you see this ideal and, and you read a lot about it and you, you understand it and you begin to look at people around you and you see, well, wait a minute, we're not ideal people, are we? So everybody seems to be wearing their flaws, you know, as a badge almost. And so you go around and you start trying to correct all these people or or worse, you begin to condemn them in your hearts because they, they're not living up to the standard and you forget to look at yourself and see that you don't live up to the standard either. And uh, if nothing else, in the way that you're looking at other people and the way that you're you know, depreciating them because they're not perfect. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, was perfect and uh, he didn't go around criticizing and uh, correcting endlessly his disciples, which he could have very easily done because he saw all their flaws, didn't he? But he didn't just stand over them and just say, you know what, this, this is a problem. But, you know, everything that they did, he could have criticized. You know, but he didn't do that. Instead, he did encourage them. Now, when they did some pretty serious things, things that needed to be corrected, he did deal with it, right? Such as when Peter says, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. This is going to happen to you. Get behind me, Satan, you know. But uh, generally, the Lord, you know, encouraged them and uh, corrected them when they needed to be corrected. Bridget? What's the procedure if, if um, say, an elder uh, says something to a person and, I mean, should they just tell you well, they should do it in. If if there is correction, they ought to do it in in private. Um, 
<laughs> just just one example. Although this isn't at a church level, I was, I went, Don and I went to a Christian college, and uh, I was you know we were living we we're married and living off campus and so forth. And at the time, I had a beard, and beards were not allowed <laughs> on the campus. It, it less, at least they weren't previous to that year. I think myself and one other student were the first exceptions in the college, but the academic dean didn't know that, and so he carted me in the <laughs> in the hallway. And he, he did that, he didn't just come out in front of everybody and say, hey, you with the beard, you know, you need to shave that off. But uh, he pulled me aside and, and told me privately so that nobody else could hear. And, uh, and I told him privately, they told me I could keep it. <laughs> so um, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. He didn't like that answer, but he, he did dis discover that was the case. But we should do that uh, in private, yeah. It only becomes public if they don't, you know, if you take two or three or one or two with you and they still don't, uh, don't repent. But the idea is here that this is a means by which we bring people back to the Lord and not, you know, we're not using it as a, as a weapon to destroy them or push them away. Okay, discipline is, is good. It has the reclamation of the sinner in view and not his destruction. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, also is a means of grace is the fellowship that the Lord has given to us. Okay, something else that the Lord has appointed in His church to build us up, that we might have communion in one another's gifts and graces, which means that we might serve one another, as uh, Paul says uh, to the church at Rome, using the gifts He's given to us to minister to one another or encourage one another with our faith. Um, you know, as we show our trust and belief in the Lord, our zeal for the Lord. I, I hope we realize that, that we do affect one another, you know, with the things that we do. And if we, if we compromise in any area of the Christian walk, it tends to give others an excuse to compromise. But if we show a zeal or a commitment that, that is strong, it, it encourages others to emulate that and to seek after that too. So what we do among one another in our um, fellowship can do a lot either to build up or to tear down. And of course, in that, we can share one another's burdens, admonish, and encourage one another. Those are other ways in which fellowship can be to us a means of grace. Now, as said here in, in point G, that these ordinances are different means by which the Lord is building us up, is given to us to, to strengthen us, and to gain the help of the Holy Spirit, to gain His influence, to uh, purify us of those influences that will actually quench the Spirit, and to build up those that will... Uh, encourage the Spirit's work within our hearts. Okay, so these are very important. So he's given to us the Word of God, and in the Word of God he's given to us these many ordinances, and of course among those as well, the ministry, which uh, goes on at two levels, and I just mentioned one, but I'll come back to it in just a minute, but obviously the Lord has equipped his church. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. He uh, has given to us this list of gifts gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, uh, there was some dispute over this prepositional phrase for the work of service um, whether or not that refers to the gifted men or whether it refers to the saints. And the question is whether he has given these gifted men to equip the saints and he has given these gifted men for the work of service or whether he has given the gifted men to equip the saints for the work of service. And really, it, it may mean... Um, that he has given the gifted men for the work of service in this passage because everything in this sentence basically has to do with what the gifted men do. But even if that's the case, what follows, uh, and we can look at that uh, on page 3b2, uh, we can see that the whole purpose of it is that we might do what we're supposed to do, what we're called to do as members of the body of Christ to build up one another. So it's not really going to matter one way or the other how we understand that because both of these truths are in the paragraph. Uh, let me read that. As a result of this ministry of gifted men, the apostles, prophets, and so forth, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, 
from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So the gifted men are to build up the saints and to equip them to do what they're supposed to do so that everyone doing their particular job builds up the whole body. Okay, builds up the whole body in love. Uh, so the ministry that the Lord has given to us is, an, is something else that he has, has given to equip us to do the work that he has called us to do. And without this ministry, we're, we're going to be greatly lacking. Okay. Uh, we are called, um, well in Romans 12, again, uh, talks about the fact that there are many members in one body. We all don't have the same function, but we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, and we should, each of us, exercise them accordingly. So the ministry is not something that the gifted men Christ gives to his church do alone, although in the past that's almost turned out to be the way that it was. That I believe, though, when you read even the Puritans, they'll say that uh, the members of the body of Christ do have that responsibility toward one another, which is to admonish, encourage, build up, uh, share one another's burdens, and all the different one another's that are in Scripture. So that's body ministry is typically called today, and uh, that's one of the things that Christ has given to us, again, to, uh, to build us up. So the first thing we see in this section is what Christ has given to us to equip his church uh, for the work that he has called her to do. Okay? Now the second thing, oh by the way, any questions about that? Okay, the second thing, what is the work that he has committed to his church? What is the work that we are called to do? Does anybody uh, who hasn't been looking at the outline think about what are the two main things that the Lord has called us to do? You looked at the outline? <laughs> Okay, that, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? We, we are called to do evangelism, right? And to put it another way, we are called to gather in the elect, right? To gather in Christ's sheep. Okay. Acts 1, 7 through 8, Christ's final call to his church before, or commission to his church before he ascends to heaven, is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. You know, um, we, we, could take this, um, we could take this generally, and we could say that this is a commission that God gave to his church uh, in order to you know, deal with everything that's going to happen throughout the, the history of the world until the time we arrive at the consummation when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Or we can take this to mean more narrowly that uh, this is the commission the apostles themselves would actually fulfill in their ministry. That they'll start in Jerusalem, then they'll go to all Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the remotest part of the Roman Empire, basically, which was the world at that time and really all that was within their grasp, all that was within their reach. And remember the book of Acts is the, the working out of that commission, isn't it? Uh, that the gospel would go to all the uh, different parts of the Roman Empire so that um, all would hear the gospel, the Jews first and also the Gentiles. And uh, Matthew 28, 19, oh, by the way, even if that does refer more narrowly to, uh, to what the apostles themselves would do, it doesn't mean that the work would be completed. It just simply means that that aspect of it would be done, and then uh, the work would continue on after that. There was going to be a new phase. There was going to be the abolishing of the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant system, and then there was going to be, of course, the, uh, well, the, well the, the New Covenant was already established, but that was going to continue, and it was going to reach all the nations, as Christ says in Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. So the church is entrusted with the gospel, with uh, those various ordinances to build us up, but especially the ministry of the Word of God, which is not meant to be directed only inwardly, but also outwardly. The gospel is to be preached to every living creature, to every man, everyone, every man, woman, and child. And of course, uh, we as uh, individual believers can also bear witness to it. And the reason being is because the gospel alone has the power to save. 
God works through the gospel and in no other way to bring about salvation except those extraordinary exceptions that we've already looked at earlier. But that's the first main thing that the church is called to do, which is to evangelize. But in order to reach that, in order to be able to do that effectively, what else does the church need to do? What is the other work committed to the church? Donna? Discipleship, which we have under here as the perfecting of the saints. We need to grow in our grace and in our knowledge, in holiness, in love basically, in love and understanding, so that we will be able to do what it is that God calls us to do. Uh, think of the exhortation in Hebrews 5, 12 through 6, 1. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant." But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. And again, I think in the context, the author to the Hebrews is saying, leave behind the shadows and types and the washings and the ceremonies of the Old Covenant. Press on to the reality, which is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow up into the head. Okay. And of course, Hebrews 12:14 reminds us of the importance of holiness. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We have to be growing in holiness in this life or we will not see the Lord. And that, of course, is a part of the work of the church. The ministry and the ordinances are meant to help us grow in holiness to pursue sanctification. And then the exhortation at the end of 2 Peter 3, 17 through 18. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Now, Christ is entrusted to his church the Word of God, the ordinances of God, and the ministry of, of the Word of God, both from the standpoint of, of the gifted men as well as the body ministry, in order to perfect us, in order to help us grow so that we will be able to do what it is He calls us to do, in, not only in our worship of Him and our individual lives living as we should live, but also so that we might reach out to the lost with the Gospel, okay, that they might be gathered in, they might be saved. Uh, remember, uh, that's the uh, purpose, that's the reason why we're here on earth. I think one of the main reasons that we're here on earth, there's probably several reasons, but is so that we might still reach out. You know, if, if whenever some, God saves somebody, they immediately went to heaven, you know, because that, that, that purpose for them is fulfilled, then um, there wouldn't be anybody left to tell anybody else what they're, about the gospel. So uh, we're, we're here to bear witness to it in our words, in our lives, in our worship. Uh, even the fact that we're gathering here on the Lord's Day is a testimony to His truth and reality. Okay, so we've seen what it is Christ has equipped us with. We've seen the work that He calls us to do. But finally, what is the guarantee that this work will be carried out through His church? When we think about what God has given us to do, it seems like a rather overwhelming task to bring the gospel to all the nations, to gather in the elect to, uh, to grow in holiness. How are we going to do that? And what guarantee do we have that that's actually going to take place? Well, really two things. Christ has promised to be with us and to work in us and through us. Okay? It says in, in the confession, reminds us, and does by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. That is, he makes the ministry, the oracles, and the ordinances of God effective for the gathering and perfecting of the saints by His presence and by His Spirit. Okay, Christ has made us a promise, and that promise is that He would be with us to help us. Uh, Matthew 28, 19-20 Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ told his apostles on another occasion, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Okay? 
And the way that he would come to them would be through the person of the Holy Spirit. It's important that I leave, he says. If I don't leave, the Comforter may not come to you, the other helper that I've given to you. And of course, we know he came on the day of Pentecost. He came in uh, great power. He empowered the disciples to do the work that Christ had called them to do. So Christ would be with them, and he would equip them by his Holy Spirit. Okay, I guess we have several of those passages uh, listed here under point two. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And then again the Acts 1, 7 through 8 passages when he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then we have in Isaiah 59 a promise or a prediction of, of how God would bless them with the power of his Holy Spirit and his word and make them effective in the new covenant. A redeemer will come to Zion and, those, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. So again, God's promise of his spirit and his word to continue within his church uh, throughout their successive generations. And of course, the spirit is the one who makes the call of the gospel effective. John 3, 7 through 8, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And John 6:63, 6, it is a Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and are life. So the guarantee that this work will be carried out is the fact that Christ will be with us, and he will give us his Spirit so that we will be able to do what he has called us to do, not only on a personal level, giving us the strength and the zeal to be able to reach out to others, but also working with those we reach out to, to effect within their hearts what he has ordained would happen, to change their hearts you know, by, again, by his grace, to quicken them to life so that they can respond to the gospel, which is what we call, again, the effectual call. Um, the inward call of the Holy Spirit. So, anyway, this, this uh, section does remind us what Christ has given to us. He reminds us of our call and he reminds us of the fact that we can do these things because he will equip us to do these things. Okay? He will work his will through his church. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be discouraged if we go out, we share the gospel with someone, they end up not accepting it. They end up uh, you know, uh, not listening to us. So we say, well, the promise of Christ has failed. Um, the Spirit is not going to work. Christ is not with His church. I mean, is that what we should conclude? Well, what, what do we conclude? Well, at least for now, the Lord is not willed to open this person's eyes, to change their, their heart, as was said a little bit earlier. We don't necessarily give up on them, but we continue to tell them, we continue to teach them, we continue to show them how, you know, the, the, what the world has embraced is, is a lie, that evolution isn't true, that you know, God is the one who made all things, that Christ is the only way of salvation. And we continue to pray for them. And we go to the next person and we continue to reach out to them. Remembering again that the gospel is the only way. The only way a person is going to be saved. It is the only power of God to salvation. There is salvation in no one else but Christ. The gospel is, is you know, Christ is the only way to heaven. That's why it's important that that message be gotten out and why it's important that we do what we can to get that message out. Okay, well, that's, um, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any comments, questions? Richard? Sometimes, you know, I mean, I think if you're grounded, you don't have so much problem with it. You know that if you're not, you can make it go away. Because, you know, there's ministers you know, that believe in what you're talking about. They know the word, and they Well, 
let's see, the question of whether they're grounded or not, it's, there have been people who have understood, let's say, the, the uh, belief of the Protestant Church and have understood even Reformed doctrine who amazingly go into either the Roman Church or the Orthodox Church. And I would say the problem there may not necessarily be that they didn't understand the doctrine, but certainly is they didn't believe it. <laughs> they didn't um, embrace it. And why they wouldn't, I think we can only trace it to a spiritual problem, which is the Spirit of God has not um, given them that conviction. You know, one thing the confession bears out is the fact that, that the Holy Spirit alone can give us the infallible assurance that, that the Bible is God's Word. And if He is not there bearing witness to it and giving that deep-seated conviction, the fact that, that this is the truth, then they're going to embrace a lie. And sadly, in those you know, the Roman Church, Orthodox Church, there's very serious errors that are con soul condemning, basically. If a person believes those things, then he will not be saved. So um, we would have to say in that case, the person did not have the Spirit working in a saving way, although it is still possible that he could be deceived for a time and eventually come back. But So you have to explain it one of the two ways. Uh, and, and also, if a person doesn't get grounded, I mean, a person, let's say, can be truly converted, and, and doesn't get grounded also. And um, they, could, they could be deceived for a while too in that way. Okay. So there's, there's several different ways in which that can happen. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well then let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning that you have given to your church so many uh, blessings, so many treasures that you've entrusted to us. Uh, the Word of God, which reveals...